Psalm 51. <clears throat> Psalm 51, if your Bible has a heading above the psalm, as mine does, says to the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. This is David's great psalm of repentance. After he had sinned, he had been confronted with his sin, and uh, then was coming to God and praying uh, to get things straightened out, to get things right with God. Psalm 51, beginning at verse 1, David prays and he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion, and fill thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering, and whole burnt offering, then shall they offer bullets upon thine altar. Now call your attention particularly to that 17th verse. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has sent me to heal the broken heart. <coughs> The priest delivers to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I want to talk to you tonight about a wounded spirit, a broken spirit, and a broken heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessings. Thank you for the time we have together. Thank you for these folks who have gathered on this Sunday evening, this holiday weekend. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look into your word. Lord, cause us to set aside those things which would distract us and direct us by your Holy Spirit. Guide us into all truth. And Lord, touch our hearts. Help us to be sensitive to your leadership. And work in us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to add a couple of verses to your thinking. Psalm, I'm sorry, Proverbs 15, 13. A merry heart. Make of the cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Proverbs 18, 14, the spirit of a man will sustain him, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? We're talking about a wounded spirit, a broken spirit, and a broken heart. You and I live in a day of wickedness. You don't have to look far to understand that. There's wickedness in society. I, I do not know, I've not been here uh, the entire history of the country, but I seriously doubt there's ever been a time in the history of this country 
when there's been more wickedness in society and more open acceptance of wickedness. And some of that is deliberate. Some of it, I think, is just blind acceptance. Some of it is apathy, I believe. There are many reasons that you can't, can't identify one single thing, but a number of things, combination of things. We also have wickedness in religion. You hear about wickedness in society, you hear about wickedness in religion and things that ought not to be. I don't think I have to go into detail for you to understand what I'm talking about. And then, of course, there's wickedness in individuals. And the way that mankind treats their fellow man, uh, the inhumanity of mankind upon mankind, I think is at an all-time high. Wickedness is more and more accepted as normal. They talk about the new normal in things. And, and I think many people have decided that this is the new normal, just to be wicked. Well, you just have to accept it. It's going to happen. It, it does happen. It's going to happen. Just, it, there's no reason why we have to accept it. What this tells us is, very clearly and very plainly, that we, and when I say we, I mean you and I, we need, we are in need of a great spiritual revival. There have been throughout the history of this country some great spiritual revivals. In colonial days, they had the Great Awakening. Later on, they had what was called the Second Great Awakening. Tremendous spiritual revival followed the wars in many cases where there had been great disaster and death. There were many people turned back to God. I think the closest thing we've seen to that in recent years was the events following September 11, 2000. One, yes. when there were people uh, flying flags on their cars and people uh, going to church who hadn't been to church in years, and the people were, the, did you notice that didn't last long? No. Very short lived. Very short lived. That's the kind of spirit we need, but not, not for a short time, for a long time. Great evangelists came up after the great wars that have happened. And D.L. Moody and, and others like him after the Civil War. And then later, uh, around the turn of the century, men like Billy Sunday uh, were preaching. And they had these great area-wide revivals. We've talked about this recently, where they would come into town and sometimes have a building, but sometimes have a building made, made and built just for that meeting. And they would preach not for a few days or a week, or even a month, but sometimes the meeting would go on several months. As long as people were coming, as long as people were responding, they'd go on. I know that Billy Sunday had his life threatened because he would go into the city and preach, and people would get right with God. On one occasion, uh, there was a saloon nearby where the meetings were being held, and the saloon owner had lost almost all his business because men had gone to the, and by the way, it was mostly men, uh, men had gone to the revival meeting, they'd gotten saved, they'd gotten right with God, they weren't going to the saloon anymore. And the story goes, the saloon owner was, was, had lost almost all his business, so he decided to put a stop to this. He grabbed his shotgun one night, went to the meeting himself, he's going to kill the evangelist. You know what happened? He got saved. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. And God moving and working in the hearts and minds of people. Our nation needs a revival. Our state needs a revival. Our county needs a revival. Our city needs a revival. But folks, our church needs a revival. There's no question about it. And once again, we, you and I, need a revival. <clears throat> now to understand the trend of things, here's what we have to do. We have to look at history. We have to look at where things have been and then look at where they are right now, and then we look at where things are headed. And if you look at where things have been, the direction they've come, where they are presently, then you can pretty much predict where things are going. You know what we're doing in our daytime? We ignore what has happened in the past. We ignore it. We only focus on today. So we don't know where things have been, and we sure don't know where things are going. We only know where we are right here now. 
And that's a problem. <coughs> Over a century ago, a group of men got together, spiritual leaders in this country. This was prior to World War I. And they looked at the trends of their day. And I've mentioned this before, they wrote a series of books, a set of books, four volume set. And it talked about the problems spiritually in our country. And these men came from different denominations. They weren't all one denomination. They came from different denominations, but they had certain things in common. Here they are. They believed, number one, the Bible was God's word. Number two, they believed in the deity of Christ. They believed in the physical incarnation of Christ, which includes the virgin birth. They believed in the sinless life of Christ. They believed in the sacrificial death of Christ for our sins. They believed in the bodily resurrection of Christ, and they believed in the personal return of Christ. And they took this set of beliefs that I've just outlined to you, and they said, these are the foundational beliefs of Christianity, regardless of what denomination you are. If you believe in these things, that's what defines a person as a Christian. And that four-volume set of books was called the fundamentals. And that's where the term fundamentalist comes from. Let me run through by you again. People who believe that the Bible is God's word. They believe that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh, or as I said it before, the deity of Christ. They believe in the virgin birth of Christ, the incarnation that God came in the flesh. They believe in the sinless life of Christ. They believe in the substitutionary death of Christ. They believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. They believe in the personal return of Christ. Now, those are not beliefs that are limited by denomination. Those are biblical beliefs based upon this, and those are things that define people as Christians. That was over a century ago. Today, if you talk about being a fundamentalist, people don't think that you are believing in the foundational doctrines of Christianity. They think you're some kind of a mental case. You not only need help, you're, you're maybe a threat to society. When they, back in the 1960s, when smoking was more popular than it is today, uh, people still smoke today, I'm sure you're aware of that, but it was more popular then than it is today for, for a number of reasons. But they came out with a cigarette specifically designed for women. Now, why would they do that? Because even then, it wasn't considered ladylike to smoke. I'm not saying no women smoke, that's not true. They certainly did, but not, not all did. It wasn't considered very ladylike to smoke, at least not in public. So they came out with a particular cigarette that was designed just for women. They called it Virginia Slims. And their advertisement for that cigarette designed specifically for women was, you've come a long way, baby. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you could say that, couldn't you? We've come a long way. But have we come in the right direction? Now listen, those men who got together, led by R.A. Torrey, Reuben A. Torrey, who was successor to D.L. Moody, was president of the Moody Bible Institute, took over Moody's evangelistic meetings, started the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, pastored the Church of the Open Door in, in Los Angeles. R.A. Torrey got this group of men together, and they, they studied, and they wrote these books, but here's something they came to the conclusion. They said, if now, this is the beginning of the 20th century, here we are now in the 18th year of the, more than halfway through the 18th year of the 21st century. The beginning of the 20th century, these men got together, they wrote these books, and here's what they concluded. They said, if, looking at where we've been, where we are now, and seeing where we are headed, if we do not change path, if we do not have a revival, America is going to be transformed from a primarily Judeo-Christian society to a primarily Eastern and heathen society. And you know what? They were exactly right. They were exactly right. How did they see this coming? Were they great prophets? 
Did they have a great moving of the Holy Spirit to guide them into seeing the future? No. They just looked at where they've been, where they were, and which way things were headed. Folks, we better do that. We better do that. Some today are on a collision course with disaster if they continue in the present direction. So what are you saying? I'm saying we need to change course. We need to head a different direction. We need a genuine spiritual revival. I read to you a while ago Proverbs 18, 14. The spirit of a man will sustain him, but a wounded spirit who can bear your spirit will sustain you. God has given you a spirit. Your spirit is born again, and it is in the image of God himself. And that spirit that you have, your human spirit, will carry you through a great many things. But what happens when your spirit gets wounded? A wounded spirit who can bear. God has given to his children the ability to endure, and that ability is our spirit. Listen, you can survive just about anything as long as your spirit is healthy. <clears throat> your body may be hurt, your body may be wounded, your body may be sick, but very similar in the way that white blood cells fight off disease and infection in our body, our spirit can fight off all kinds of difficulties and problems that we come into and hard times. We say to each other, how are you doing? Now, when you ask that, do you do that just to be polite? You don't know what to say. You see somebody, so you say, how are you doing? Or do you really want to know how they're doing? A lot of times people don't want to know. I heard about a fellow one time. Uh, a person told me they, they went to a pastor, their pastor, and they said, how are you doing? And the pastor said, okay, how are you doing? And you know what? They started to tell him. And he said, no, look, when I say how you're doing, I, I'm just being polite. I'm just being friendly. I don't really want to know all your problems. Now, folks, I'm not, I'm not like that. I don't have the answer to all your problems, but if you want to tell me, I, I've been in places, I was in the bank one day, and I said to the man behind the counter, I said, how are you doing? He said, okay. I, if I said I wasn't okay, nobody would listen. I said, I would. He said, you would? I said, yeah. Go ahead and tell me. You know what? He did. Right there in the bank, right there in the bank. And he had some problems. <laughs> he did. Now, folks, listen to me. When we say that, you can say, I'm doing well. If you can honestly say, my spirit is good. And my spirit is good because of the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior. As long as you have a healthy spirit, there's hope for you. There's hope. Now, there is, Hebrews 9, 27, tells us the point on the man wants to die. There is a sickness unto death. There's a point where we're going to get sick and we're not going to recover. It happened to Elijah. Elijah was a great healer. And Elijah brought a young man back from the dead. But one day, Elijah got sick and Elijah passed away. And you know, Elisha, excuse me, Elisha, I get those two. My bad. Elisha. Elisha got sick and Elisha passed away. And you know what? They buried him in a cave. And one day another man died and they were, they'd had the funeral. They are carrying the other man out to bury him. And as they're walking, have the funeral procession, they see enemy soldiers coming. When they saw enemy soldiers coming, they very quickly took the body of the man they were about to bury, put him in the tomb where Elisha was buried. And when he touched Elisha's bones, he revived him. So what does that tell you? It tells you that God was still using Elisha, but that didn't stop him from getting sick and passing away. Does that make sense to you? But when a person, even a physically healthy person, loses the health of their spirit, then they're sick indeed. Now, anyone who has never come to the Lord Jesus and had their sins forgiven, Anyone who's never done that is not spiritually sick. Now, I know what you think. You think, no, that sounds spiritually sick to me. No, the, the truth of the matter is they're not spiritually sick. They're spiritually dead. Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 1 to 5, And you hath he quickened who were, past tense, dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, 
the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. What's Paul saying? We were all like that. We were all in that situation. We were all spiritually dead. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us, made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved. What Paul's saying is the lost person doesn't need their spirit to be healed. They, he needs their spirit to be born again. They need new life. But the same person who has new life can get a wounded spirit. So everyone, saved and lost, needs to come to Jesus and have their sins forgiven by grace and have their spirit made alive through his love and power. And if you've never done that or if you don't understand that, we, we're here to help people with that. That's one of the reasons we have a church, one of the primary reasons we have a church. But even people who have trusted Christ are susceptible to failures and lapses. When David wrote Psalm 51, he had had a failure in his life. He was a strong man. He was a courageous man. He was a leader among men. But he had his failures. He had his faults. And he had a great moral defeat. And as he had a great moral defeat, his heart was broken. When he realized the depth of his own sin. What are you saying? I'm saying you can get a wounded spirit. You can get a wounded spirit. Someone has offended you. Or something offended you. And you are deeply hurt. I'm not saying the hurt isn't real. It may be very real. It may not be imaginary. It may not be all in your mind. You may be genuinely hurt. And you've tried to keep the thing within yourself, and you've tried to just live with it and go on. But it bothers you, and it stays with you, and you can't seem to overcome it. And the result is that you yourself have gotten a wounded spirit. Now, you didn't get that wound by focusing on Jesus. You didn't. Remember the night... The disciples went out on the Sea of Galilee where they'd been countless times before. And the Lord Jesus told them to go. And a storm came up. And he was asleep, it says, in the hinder part of the ship. And the waves were tremendous. And it looked like the boat might sink. And they went to Jesus. And they woke him up. And what did they say? Master, carest thou not that we perish? Don't you care that we perish? That's why we sang that hymn while ago. Does Jesus care? Yes, indeed, he cares. So what did he do? He got up. He looked at the storm and said, Peace, be still. And the storm stopped. And the waves calmed. Bob Puffer stood right here and sang one of the many songs that he's written in Songs called This Boat Cannot Sink When Jesus Is In It. You think about that. Do you think about do you seriously think that boat was going to sink with the Lord in, on board? Probably not. Probably not. You didn't get a wounded spirit by focusing upon Jesus. You got a wounded spirit because you allowed yourself to focus on yourself. Now that you have a wounded spirit, the devil can put a magnifying glass over it so that before long you won't be able to see anything or anyone else but your wound. It becomes the most important thing in the world to you. And when you reach that state, you are near to being finished. But there is hope. There is hope if you will turn that hurt over to the Lord Jesus and learn to forgive others as you have been forgiven, then he will heal that wound for you. In Matthew 18, 23 to 35, we'll not turn there. But the Lord Jesus gives the story of the servant who owed his master much and could not pay it, but his master forgave him. 
Then this same man who was forgiven goes to a fellow servant who owes him a little bit and demands payment and will not forgive the debt and plans to put the, the fellow servant in prison. The master hears about this and takes the first debtor and puts him in prison. Then Jesus concluded the story in the 35th verse by saying, So likewise shall my heavenly Father also do unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. What he's saying is, why don't you confess your bitterness to Jesus? Why don't you forgive that person who has offended you before your wounded spirit becomes a broken spirit? Because that is the only way in which you are going to be healed. And that is the only way that your spirit will be able to sustain you. Now the second verse that I read to you a while ago, Proverbs 15, 13. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. I like comedy. I do. I, I like clean comedy. I don't like vulgar comedy. I like clean comedy. I got really embarrassed a few years ago. I'd heard a fellow uh, do a comedy routine, and it was clean, and it was funny, and I liked it. And I commented to somebody, I said, well, you know, I like, I like what that guy had to say. So they, trying to do me a good turn, bought me a video of the fellow. I was so sorry. Mm -hmm. I was so sorry. I watched the video. The first two or three jokes were, were good and clean and funny, and then some of the vulgar stuff you ever heard. Mm -hmm. I was so sorry. I said, what'd you do? I threw it away. What'd you do? I mean, honestly, there's no need for that. But good comedy. Good comedy is helpful. Merry heart, making a cheerful countenance. But by sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. Again, Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. But a broken spirit drieth the bones. A wounded spirit that is not healed will become a broken spirit. But the joy that comes from forgiving and being forgiven makes a merry heart. And a merry heart does good like a medicine. A broken spirit can make you physically sick, but there is healing in forgiveness. Now, we come to Psalm 51. I hope you still have your Bible open. I know we've been a long time getting there. David was harboring sin in his heart. It had just about ruined his spirit and his life. It had cost him dearly. It would cost him the life of several of his sons, including his little infant son, but not limited to. It cost him rebellion in his kingdom. But more sadly, it cost him rebellion in his own family. Nathan the prophet came along and saw what was happening and pointed it out to David. He tells David a story. He said, King, there was a fellow here in your kingdom who had just one little ewe lamb. He didn't keep it out in the pen, kept it in the house with him. Matter of fact, the lamb slept with him at night in the bed with he and his family. They didn't treat that lamb like food. They didn't treat that lamb as a source of income. They treated that lamb as one of the family. But his neighbor, who had a great flocks and herd, had guests who came unexpectedly. And he didn't want to sacrifice one of his flocks, one of his flock for his guests. So he took his neighbor's one little lamb. He served it to his guests to eat. And David becomes angry. He becomes wroth, the Bible says. And he says, that man shall die. And Nathan looks David in the eye and says, thou art the man. And David's heart was broken. Not because Nathan had been unkind. Not because Nathan was treating him badly. But because David realized his own sin. Then David wrote these words. First of all, he confessed his sins. Look at verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me truly from mine iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Do you see what he's saying? He does not say, 
Lord, deliver me from Nathan, that unkind preacher who comes and tells me what I'm doing wrong. He says, have mercy upon me, O God. Blot out my transgression. Wash me and cleanse me. I acknowledge my transgression. David is saying, I confess my sin. John would write centuries later, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. David says, my sin is ever before me. I can't forget it. I can't get away from it. And then he says, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Have you thought about that? When we sin, we sin against God. Who is it who tells us what is right and what is wrong, what is holy and what is not? Who is it that tells us why is God himself? When we sin, we sin against God. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. I deserve the judgment that I give. And in verse 5, David says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. David is not saying anything bad about his mother there. What he's saying is, I am a sinner because I was born a sinner. I was a sinner from the day I first took breath. And David, who has the unique distinction in all the Bible as being called by God himself, a man after my own heart. David says, but I'm still a sinner. He'd had many blessings. He'd become a great king. He'd become known as a man of God. He wrote part of the Bible, a large part. But then he said, I'm still a sinner. In verse 6, he says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, that reed like plant that they priest would use to take the blood of the sacrificed lamb and sprinkle the altar for forgiveness. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. David was a shepherd. He knew all about this. Sometimes when a, a lamb would wander off, the shepherd would bring that little one back to the flock so that it would be safe and with the flock and not fall to some predator. But if the lamb perpetually wandered off and had a habit of leaving the flock, sometimes the shepherd would go and he would catch that little lamb and he would take his shepherd's staff and he would break one of the lamb's legs. <clears throat> then he would carefully bind it up so that it could heal. And then he would carry that lamb on his shoulders until that leg healed, the lamb was able to walk again. And you know, generally speaking, that lamb never wandered off again. That's the imagery David is using here when he says, Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. He's saying to God, I wandered away. As the hymn writer says, I wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin, too long I've trod. Now I'm coming home. In the ninth verse. David, please hide thy face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. David here identifies two important things. He says, my problem is not external. My problem is internal. My problem is not in other people. My problem is in me. It is in my heart. My heart is dirty. I need a clean heart. My spirit is wounded. I need a right spirit. Renew a right spirit within me. David is concerned about his spiritual health. In verse 11, he says, cast me not away from thy presence. You know, Paul was concerned about that. He was concerned, he said, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become a castaway. He wasn't talking about losing his salvation. He wasn't talking about losing his place in heaven. He was talking about losing his position of service. He was talking about being put on the shelf, being set aside, and no longer being used of God. And that's what David says here. 
cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now in the Old Testament economy, the Holy Spirit came upon people and left people and David had seen that. The Spirit of God had come upon Saul when he was anointed king, but the Spirit of God left Saul and came upon David when he was anointed king. And David said, if it happened to Saul, it could happen to me. Oh Lord, don't take your spirit from me. I do not want to lose the presence of your spirit. And then David talks about restoration. In verse 12, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Hey, remember that? Remember when you first got saved, how you felt? Remember how you felt like a new person? You remember how things did generally seem to be new to you? And remember how you wanted to tell people what had happened to you? Remember how your life was changed and you felt that everything was going to be better now? And you were right. But you know what happens to us? Time goes by. And we as Christians, we kind of tend to forget that. That's one of the reasons I encourage you to give your salvation testimony often, to keep the experience fresh in your own heart and mind. Because we can grow apathetic in our Christian walk. And we can lose that joy. And David says, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. That joy I had when I was first born again. Uphold me with thy free spirit. I need your spirit, Lord. My spirit has become wounded. My spirit has become broken. I need your spirit for my strength. And then after he talks about restoration, he talks about results. When this has happened, when you've restored the joy of my salvation, when you have upheld my free spirit, then, verse 13, will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. David's teaching us a great lesson here. He's saying if we want to see other people saved, we have to be right with God first. We need to take care of our own heart. We need to take care of our own life. We need to take care of our own spirit. And then we'll see sinners converted. David longs to be a witness and a testimony for the Lord as he had been before. Oh, there was a day when they looked at David and they said, hey, there's David. There's the man after God's own heart. There's a man who loves the Lord. There's a man we can be like him. But now, things were different. And as King David walked in front of his people, they began to whisper and began to say to each other, Have you heard about King? You heard about David? Hey, did you hear what happened? Did you hear what he did? And David has lost his witness, and he's lost his effectiveness as a witness to others. So in verse 14, he prays, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. <clears throat> deliver me from my own guilt. And not once in this psalm does he point the finger of accusation at others. He sees it in his own self, in his own heart. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. I'm not bringing you those sacrifices, not because... I'm being rebellious, but because I know that's not the real need. Where's the real need? The real need is in verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. If you have wounded spirits, if you've got a broken spirit, what do you need to do? You need to bring that to God. And a contrite heart. You know what a contrite heart is? A contrite heart is a heart that's grieving over guilt. Many, many years ago, we were here in church, and one of the ladies who was a member of the church at that time said to me, said, you know, when you're preaching, you lay a lot of false guilt on us. I said, I don't. 
I said, and the reason I don't is I don't need to. Most people got enough of the real thing. And you know what? I don't think she liked that. But it's the truth. I'm not here to lay false guilt on anybody. How ridiculous. If I'm guilty, it's not false guilt, it's real guilt. Well, what if you're not guilty? Then I have nothing to worry about, do I? <clears throat> Sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou wilt not despise. Did you get that? The Lord is not going to despise. If you come to him with your wounded spirit, your broken spirit, your broken heart, he will not despise you. He will not turn you away. He will not say, no, you failed. I gave you opportunity. I saved you. I forgave you. And I have set you on the right course and you failed. You'll not say that. If you come to him with a wounded spirit, a broken spirit, a broken heart, he will not despise you. What will he do? He'll forgive you. The Lord <coughs> accepted David's prayer. The Lord accepted David's wounded spirit and his broken spirit and his contract broken heart. So then David says, do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. He's not concerned about himself now. He's concerned about his people. Make Jerusalem strong again. Verse 19, then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullets upon their altar. When we have confessed things, then the Lord will be pleased with our offerings. When our heart is right, when our spirit is right, when we've come back to him, and that's what a spiritual revival is. Then, then, the Lord will accept our offerings. David saw his own sin. He brought his broken spirit and broken heart to God who specializes in healing broken hearts. Remember the verse we first quoted to you? Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, preach deliverance to the captives, set at liberty and the blind. He's come. He's come to heal the broken hearts. He'll heal yours. When David repented of his sin and confessed his sin, the Lord healed his broken spirit, his broken heart, and his relationship to God was restored. That's what John means when he says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. His sin had caused him to lose influence with others as a child of God. But now, now he can witness again. Now sinners will be converted again. Now he has a testimony again. Now his life is a testimony of God's grace again. I believe what we need to do is trade in our wounded spirit and our broken heart. Let the Lord Jesus give us a new spirit and a new heart. Let him heal us. Let us start over and be happy and be fresh and be clean. Just like when we were first saved. That's what revival is. I believe tonight probably everybody in the room is trusting the Lord as their Savior. We'll not dwell on that. But the truth of the matter is, we do need to take a fresh look at our own self, our own relationship with God and with God's people. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. Some here may have a wounded spirit. Some here may have a broken spirit. 
Some here may have a broken heart. Lord, we come to you for forgiveness. We come to you for healing. We come to you asking you to help us to be people who forgive and to be people who will be used by you as a witness and a testimony to others of your love, of your grace, of your forgiveness. Lord, work in us, we pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. will not explain the invitation. God spoke into your heart. The altar's here if you need it. Father, bless in this time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together tonight. We're singing 340.